COP29 and we're here at the Digital Pavilion and I'd love to say that we have a whole lot of expert speakers and of course we have Lucas here and he's going to tell us, Lucas come on, yes. tell us how exciting this afternoon is going to be. about digital innovation especially for the ocean, great topic for today. And we have uh, I'm Sohaila and I'm really happy to present YLE Foundation and the Digital uh, Innovation Pavilion and we're here to save the oceans. And we have Jen here with us. Hi, I'm Jen. I work in climate and AI at MIT and really excited to be here. And Suela has a whole team out here. Uh -huh. I mean, we're talking women brigade here today, Lucas. Yeah. What about you? <laughs> 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 Thank you. I'm climate lead at UNF Triple C Secretariat and thank you so much for this opportunity. Just listening to all of you was very, very inspiring. Um, I think I just want to share a little bit on the ocean under the UNF Triple C process and how all of you can contribute to it. So, as you know, uh, we had um, the ocean is mentioned both in the Paris Agreement and the Convention, and uh, the ocean is considered a very integral part of uh, the biodiversity and is referred to as uh, Mother Earth. And uh, we also need to start including ocean in their relevant work plans um, and activities. And then comes uh, the Egypt Sharma Sheikh implementation plan where parties are now encouraged to continue including the ocean in the national climate action plans, including the NDCs and the adaptation, communications and the NAP, etc. It was also a very important topic. We have Jen here uh, who will expound on AI and the oceans. Thank you so much. Yes, I'm Jen. I work at MIT. I'm practice leader of climate and energy AI at the Martin Trust Center for MIT Entrepreneurship, where I build AI tools for climate innovators. For example, we have a suite of policy tools that lets climate entrepreneurs see the regulations and incentives relevant to their business idea, or to run techno-economic analyses, or identify potential funders. So these are tools that we have a suite of policy tools that lets climate entrepreneurs see the regulations and incentives relevant to their business idea, or to run techno-economic analyses, or identify potential funders. So these are tools that can be helpful to innovators working in the ocean space to figure out in a quick way what incentives are relevant to them. We were encouraged by hearing from a startup who said that they had engaged the founders of climate tech startups. They have about 350 portfolio companies. And I looked at a number of ocean-based companies through that. Some ones that I found really interesting are coral restoration companies or companies that are using AI to do things within the ocean, such as gathering and analyzing compl uh, complex data sets for making key decisions. So I've seen some really interesting companies that are building kind of an underwater satellite to map seafloor health. Uh, digitally, uh, from data input to uh, create uh, digital assets, which is uh, tradable. So um, I think this format, uh, which is called, uh, our standard is called Carbon Tribe Standard. Uh, currently we have um, standards for uh, mangrove ARR, uh, forest ARR, and the methane and N2O. N2O is 300 times uh, more impact to the global warming. And I think um, uh, these uh, um, available methodologies are uh, already useful, but we, the good thing is about us is that we can create our own authorized uh, uh, standard or methodologies additionally. So uh, currently we are talking the company, for example, like we're making um, uh, um, current and uh, or heat pump. Or for example, like those uh, heat pump or current, we can also create the carbon removal. For uh, example, like we're making um, uh, um, current and uh, or heat pump. Or for example, like those uh, heat pump or current, we can also create the carbon removal uh, uh, certificate. So I think uh, uh, this format will um, make a, a good impact for the environment. Also, in the future, we are also considering the um, some blue economy more, more than a, um, um, mangrove, just a mangrove, but also other 
uh, format. So uh, we really looking forward to collaborate with other like uh, um, yeah um, project. Thank you. So it's brilliant. Of course, we in Mumbai went underwater, and we had kids in the hutments. Everyone met me, and then I said, you know, like you just can't do social work with biscuits and blankets anymore. You have to go beyond it. Then we started our research, and again, data collection, and it, of course, it was plastic pollution, uh, clogging all the marine ecosystems, lakes, rivers, and everything that led up to the oceans in, in our city, Mumbai. So that's what it led to. So unless you're in it and you really feel for it, I mean, that's your underlying mission that really drives you. So, have been in a tsunami. Have been caught in the middle of a disaster. Any of you? Uh, I was, I was uh, in, um, in the Hurricane Irma in uh, 2017 in the Caribbean. That was category five. So we had a development there and it was it was scary. I mean, you saw palm trees flying horizontally like two sticks, 380 kilometers an hour. So it's... Yeah, so you know it comes from the soul and the heart. 2022 as well, the Ocean Conference. And uh, like you said, science is key, knowledge is key. And therefore, like I shifted and evolved into just field work to focusing on ocean literacy. Especially for the global south, where I come from. I mean, COP29 is about the finance COP, as we all know, right? We're all looking for funding, we're looking for transparency, we're looking for everything on the table, right? And where it reaches. So, we at the global south, we face the world, and uh, like many other countries too, all the islands. So, um, there are many children who haven't seen the ocean. Absolutely don't know what it is like you know what uh, just on tv or on their mobile phones or whatever so ocean literacy which is now recognized so our ocean literacy program has been uh, recognized by the um, unesco um, and we are running out of time uh, my name is Ahmed Chatri and I'm leading the Risk Blocking Foundation. Uh, we are working, uh, part of our work is uh, for plastic uh, pollution. Uh, it's a story, a short story, 2016. Uh, we were making the, uh, like uh, photography, looking for photography, uh, National Park in Red Sea. And I'm also scuba diving, advanced. So I. <laughs> We were capturing a uh, video for a bird called Sakosti in Rango. During GR, during that, I found that outside the nest is Sakosti is feeding his jamalai with plastic. We bring it from the sea. At the time, we launched a program called uh, Zero Plastic in Red Sea Islands. And I'm happy that we have someone from Canada with us because uh, Canada NBC supported us in Cairo for this project. It were uh, supported for one year to making uh, free plastic at uh, Red Sea Island. By 2019, uh, during the pandemic, they draft a law for banning single-use plastic in Asia. And this law entered to work last year. Not at 300 percent, but we are following. And uh, after COP, just uh, just a few hours after this COP, applied to uh, South Korea for Island C5. The problem is in South Korea for IDC5. The problem is an issue about the uh, plastic and the new treaty of the plastic. The issue here I'd like to talk about is we, in our generation, are lucky to have seen our ocean, our sea, by with shark, by with sea turtle. I hope the new generation can see what we have seen. I hope everyone can look at to the ocean and didn't find plastic or garbage everywhere in the States. Second, it is very important when we are talking about the local community, they are the first line of defense for our seas and our oceans. I remember when we started our project for uh, eating plastic at Red Sea and Wadi Kemal protected area in Egypt, we were going to a school for the children to talk with them how the plastic is uh, and how we can remove it and how they can care about it especially what is the man protected area is in the line of mangrove so there is a lot of mangrove and when we go now we find them both a very 
with the slogan inside the protected area, take nothing and leave nothing. This is where very important for us and that the children will try to them when he eighteen now they are in the university or something and they support the community about it. Hi, I'm Jennifer Terlick. I'm the practice leader of Climate and Energy AI at the Martin Trust Center for MIT Entrepreneurship, where I build AI tools for climate innovators. For example, a suite of policy tools that helps climate entrepreneurs see the relevant regulations and incentives for their business idea, as well as tools to do techno-economic analysis, finance plans, and more. I'm really excited to be here at COP Day 3 and to be speaking at this event at the Digital Pavilion, the Digital Innovation Pavilion. Excited to see you. Thank you very much for the opportunity and um, well, we are very busy on uh, the Blue Economy Space as a foundation. We're based in Italy and uh, we're going to launch in 2025 a new project which is um, basically the first uh, disclosure framework for uh, the industry. Um, on Ocean Impact, and uh, it's called the Ocean Disclosure Initiative, and uh, we'll be launching that out on the uh, Big Young Conference in June. Oh, excellent. And so we've been working on this with different universities, also with um, our partners with McKinsey, mm -hmm. and so um, watch this space. <laughs> I think it's exciting news because um, finally there is a um, uh, disclosure framework available for the industry that should actually help the industry to um, be aware of their ocean impacts, that um, obviously can be direct or indirect. And so we spent the last five years on developing this, and um, I think it's exciting news for the ocean. Okay, so it's day three of COP29, and how are you finding it? Um, pretty busy. Okay. <laughs> I think um, it's, it's What are it's you fine. asking um, out of COP29 this year, Mark? Well, let's say the, the, the feedback so far also on the, just the recent biodiversity COP um, are not that encouraging, but uh, we really hope to make this uh, step forward. And um, sort of, you know, sometimes when the expectations are low, you can maybe make some positive surprises. So let's hope we can, we can make that type of change. Do you think the and UN or CC at um, Nice next year in June will be think, well, very, very helpful for the work that you're doing? I think so and I hope so. I think also the French government is really pushing to, to, uh, to have some concrete change um, and um, otherwise we're just um, unfortunately seeing that all the statistics keep climbing up on climate change mainly and um, also everything is linked uh, with ocean so yes. our mission is ocean um, related but I mean you cannot talk about climate change without considering the ocean. So, so I'm going to connect you to Cockpit in Brazil <laughs> and that's where you will be really you know, um, it's it's live and living out there, and they believe in oceans and everything. But more so, like somebody said, without blue, there's no green. And who would they that be? Cinderella. Yeah, and you're making a lovely podcast on her, right? Yes. So tell us more about those series. Well, it's uh, we're launching the the podcast series during COP, and so um, it's called um, As Above So Below. And um, yes, um, Sylvia is going to be one of our first um, hosts, um, so we had the pleasure to have her on the podcast. We have yeah. one of the projects that we're um, on, on the hope spots that we're doing with her yes. in the Mediterranean, wow. and so we're very busy on that as well. And uh, well, she's a great leader and uh, yeah. super inspiration, I think, for all of us. So. Yes, absolutely. And she's my guru too, so my hands is going to speak more about her as we progress this afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you.